Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another virtual broadcast brought to you by Spirit of God Christian Church. We are so excited and thankful for another service to be able to bring the Word of God to you virtually each week and to those who continuously tune in and support the ministry. If it's your first time tuning in, welcome. We hope you enjoy today's service and continue to join us each week. Stay tuned because we have an exciting service planned for you this morning, beginning with corporate prayer, worship and song, and a word from our pastor, Pastor Randall Nyan. Join us for in-person service every first and second Sunday at 10 a.m. at the Doubletree Hilton Roswell Hotel. Join us for Zoom Bible study each Thursday night at 7 p.m. Remember, questions are always welcome, and be sure to invite someone to dive into the Word of God with you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Deacon Derek Madison. Welcome to Corporate Prayer. Before we get started, like we normally do, we're going to go ahead and read a scripture. I know a lot of kids have gone back to school this past week. And so what I'm going to do for out of fairness for all of us, we're going to do a quick history and English lesson. But don't worry, easy questions and it's going to be an easy lesson. OK, well, we're just going to go back, actually brief history and read the scripture from last week. I believe this scripture has been just settling and, and just just moving around in your heart. And I believe it's ministering to a lot of people. We know God's word is quick, alive, and it's powerful. So the scripture will be Habakkuk, and we're going to read the second chapter and the second verse. And it says this, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. That's a powerful scripture and I love that. And then, you know, my mind goes back to just last month and the, the word that pastor delivered to us from the Lord was this, what is a priority for God must be a priority for me. What is a priority for God must be a priority for me. Now we see God is just setting this up because now we see God shared with us on last week, and this is all the part of the history lesson, is this, here's the vision. It was made plain. And then at the end of the, of, of the service on last week, we saw the vision. God is really setting us up to understand the vision, but it's not just about our church and our church building. God also has a vision and a plan for your life. I know it. And then here comes the English lesson. The English lesson is this, prefix. That's something that you put in front of a word and it kind of changes the word. So the question that the Lord asked me, and I'm gonna give it back to you as well, is this, what are you putting in front of the vision? For me, he said, are you pro-vision? If, are you pro my vision, Derek? In other words, if you are pro, if you are for my vision, you put that together, he said, I'll give it back to you. I'll be your pro vision. But there are other options. We can be anti-vision. We can be die vision where you cause division. And if that comes back to you, do you want things in your life divided? Do you want things in your life to be going against you? He, he said, you can be revision. You know, you can have to do things over and over again and waste time. Why? Because you're not provision. God is simply saying to us, he wants us to be provision in every area of our life because he wants to be provision for us. I tell you what, when we are provision, that means the things that we put ahead of the vision will align with the vision. You know, in my own household, I know what, what comes into my house, the, the ideas that people may tell us that we can do, if it doesn't align with the vision of our household, I know I'm not gonna do it. Why? Because it's not provision, and I want provision in my household. And I hope this word just encourages you 
to be provision for whatever it is that God has told you to do. Don't put excuses in front of the vision. Don't say I'm too old. Don't say I'm, I'm uneducated. Don't say I'm unqualified. God said be provision. And when we do that, he said he will be our provision. With that in mind, let's go into corporate prayer. Hallelujah, Father, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we thank you. Hallelujah. God, we praise you for the vision, God, that has been casted to your people. Father, we thank you because you've placed a vision down in the heart of our pastor. And God, we believe that it has been made plain to us. God, we know that we can read it and we can run with it. God, we will be provision, God. The things that you have said that we can do, God, we will be provision for that. Father, we thank you that you are working and you are moving in the lives of your people. Father, we just came today, God, to give you praise. God, to give you glory and to give you honor just for who you are. God, you are amazing. You are mighty. You are magnificent. You are perfect in every one of your ways. God, we thank you because we know that nothing catches you off guard. God, nothing perplexes you. God, nothing confuses you. God, we thank you because you are omniscient. You are all-knowing. God, you are omnipotent because you are all-powerful. And God, we thank you because you are omnipresent. God, you are everywhere. So God, we thank you for your spirit. God, that is being poured out on your people. Father, we pray that no matter where we are today, listening to today's message, God, that you are there and you are present. Father, we pray right now, God, over your servant who will deliver your word. Father, we pray for a word that is fitly spoken. God, we pray for a word in season. Father, we just pray that you will use our brother, God, to send a word, God, that we know we need to hear. Father, we pray for your anointing and your power and your presence, God, to be in this service. Father, we pray that you have your way on this day. And God, we pray over our children, God, who have gone back to school. Father, we pray that you continue to cover them, that you continue to protect them. God, that you continue to be their provision. God, that you continue to be everything that they need. Father, we pray over the teachers who are teaching our children. Father, we pray over the administrators. Father, we pray for all of those who are in the schools. And Father, we pray that if there are any that mean them harm, God, we come against it in the name of Jesus. And Father, we just pray right now, God, that you be glorified in the lives of your people. And God, will be so careful to give your name all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor that is only do your name. For Father, we know what you are doing. God, only you can do. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The blood that Jesus shed for me way, way back on gives me strength from day to today. It will never lose, never lose its power.
gives me strength from day The blood that Jesus shed for me, you ought to make that personal this morning. It will never lose its power that his blood reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. His blood was shed for you and for me for the remission, the removal of our sins. That's something you ought to just sing praises and thanks to God for the blood of Jesus Christ. For salvation comes by no one else other than Jesus Christ. And his blood, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the whole world was shed for you and for me. That's the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm Pastor Randall Knight, Pastor of Spirit of God Christian Church. We have already been ministered to in a magnificent way. I don't know if, you, if you're just tuning in. Corporate prayer has a word for your life today that goes with what God has been doing in this house. Deacon Derek Madison did such a marvelous job, and I want to thank him for that. Certainly want to thank CC and the music ministry for that song and getting us into a place in preparation for Holy Communion this morning. And it is just a privilege and it's an honor to come to you this morning in the name of the true and living God. And I just want to thank all of you for tuning in and being so faithful in all it is that we have done catching the vision and being a part of what God is doing here at Spirit of God Christian Church and what God is going to do. And so today we want to take the privilege it is. It's not a right, it's a privilege, it's an honor to come to the Lord's table and to partake of Holy Communion. It is about us coming and doing it in remembrance of Him. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So right now, I just want everybody to clear your hearts, clear your heads, and let our minds be stayed on him. Let our hearts be focused in on him. Let us connect to the true and living God as we prepare to go to Holy Communion. But let us pray first. Father, we thank you for this day. We bless your name. We thank you for the sacrifice that is Jesus the Christ. We thank you that by his shed blood, we can receive remission or forgiveness of sin. We pray, Heavenly Father, and we thank you for his life and his death, his burial and his resurrection. But Lord, we thank you for his shed blood. And Lord, as we come to this, your table, remove anything in us that's not like you. And God, just help us to live lives that do reflect you. And Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. And we put our minds on Christ, him hanging on that cross, being nailed and being pierced, slapped, spat upon. But God, he did it for us. And we thank you that you loved us so that you gave your only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This we ask and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Those of you at home, if you are able to, um, the bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ that was crucified on Calvary's cross for you and for me. It is the great, not only sacrament of the church, this is, a, this is a fact that Jesus Christ died, that he lived, that he was sinless, and that he died for all of humanity. Not only do archaeologi ar archaeological facts historical facts, biblical facts, but the truth of the matter is you know in your heart of hearts that he did live and that he died and rose again. But we do it today with thanksgiving for his body was sacrificed for you and for me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ crucified on Calvary's cross for you and for me. Let us take and eat all of it. Amen. The blood of our Lord was shed that no longer would physical lambs be needed. No longer would there be any other animal sacrifices needed because the true Lamb of God had come and made his sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. Christ's blood was shed so that our sins could be washed away. All we have to do is receive it. But right now, as we do this in remembrance of him, let us receive what he did on that cross for you and for me. Let us receive the washing that comes only by the blood of the true Lamb of God by Jesus the Christ. The blood of our Lord was shed on Calvary's cross for you and for me for the remission of sin. Let us take and drink all of it with thanksgiving.
amen and amen. Again, good morning to every, all of you, and I'm just grateful and thankful uh, that we were able to commune together today. Also, I want to just give you a couple of housekeeping issues, and then I want to present someone to you to bring forth the word of the Lord today that is going to bring a word that is powerful, a word that continues to drive home. And I, I do thank God for all of us being on one accord, whether it be the deacons or whomever may, God may deliver the word through, uh, and from with all of you, because many of you have let me know and let this church know just by your attendance, um, by your giving, by your behavior, by your service, that you're in it with us. And so we thank God for each and every one of you. Just a couple of quick things. We had Bible study, had a great Bible study this past Thursday night uh, as we began to answer a question that I had about the, the six days of creation. Were they literal days, literal 24-hour days, uh, or were they a longer period of time? And again, uh, go back and listen to Bible study. Thank you to the media team, uh, not only for this broadcast, but for also getting Bible study up always. And so it's up on YouTube, and I just pray that it blesses you. I pray that it at least uh, gives you some understanding, and all you're getting, you will get understanding in that as well. And then um, we're in person again next Sunday um, on the 13th, and so if you're in the local area, I encourage you to come on and worship with us. Again, we are, uh, you know, first and second Sundays, as we've talked about, that's what the Lord has instructed us to do, and obedience is better than sacrifice. So I do believe God is going to minimize some of the sacrifice because we're obeying him and doing what we're doing. And again, we're taking that which, uh, you know, third, fourth, or even fifth Sundays, and we're putting that toward the building project as we move along speedily toward that. So again, uh, if you're in a local area and you're able to, come on out and worship with us on first and second Sunday, which will be for August, will be um, the 13th, will be our next one as well. But we'll be here, Lord willing, virtually each and every week for you. And I thank all of you for just staying in there and continuing to walk in what God has called this church to walk in as well. Now, I also want to give a, a special thanks to our brother Antonio Newman for a marvelous men's ministry on Saturday. And uh, again, God continues to use him to bless our brothers. And I just continue to just thank God for whom he sends to this house and how he sends them and those who step up and serve and are willing to do what is necessary to continue to keep the work of the Lord going in this place. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, Spirit of God, Christian Church, today you know one thing I've always taught you. It's never about the messenger. It's always about the message. And today God has tapped on the shoulder Elder Daryl Thompson to come to each and every one of you with a word from the Lord through him. And I pray that you will receive him as he comes. As many of you know, he has been a long time, not only member, but a long time servant of the Lord in this house. Uh, I believe over 10 years now. Uh, if not, it's getting pretty close. <laughs> Amen. He is um, uh, the husband to his wife, Janine. Uh, and I believe that they're coming up on 20 years uh, in marriage, uh, maybe at 19 right now. Uh, he has a son, Jonathan, who is now off to his alma mater, the University of Michigan, and a daughter, Kimberly, as well. Uh, he is one who loves God. He is one who loves this church. And he is one who told me from day one, I'm here to serve. And he has been a man of his word. He has kept his word. Therefore, I want us to receive him today by which the Lord has sent him. Receive what thus saith the Lord through Elder Darrell Thompson this morning. Get ready. The next voice that you will hear will be that of Elder Darrell Thompson, who will bring forth the word of the Lord for this house this morning. Hear ye him and receive him in the manner by which God has sent him. Good morning, Spirit of God, Christian Church family, and all of our visitors who are tuning in today. I'm Minister Darrell Thompson, and I'm so happy to come to you with a word from God. Before I uh, actually get into my message, I just want to thank my brother Deacon Derek Madison for such a powerful corporate prayer. We all must do a better job of having the pro vision. And if you missed that, please go back, listen to what he taught us, and join him as he prays to our Lord and Savior. I also want to say thank you to Pastor Knighton um, just for allowing me this opportunity to speak with you this morning. I truly appreciate our friendship and his leadership as the shepherd of this flock. I don't take that for granted, and I truly appreciate the trust that he gives me 
to allow me an opportunity to deliver with thus saith the Lord. Uh, last but certainly not least, I would like to thank my family, my son Jonathan, my daughter Kimberly, and of course my wife Janine. Now with those uh, important courtesies out of the way, I just want to let you know that I'm here and this sermon this morning is actually a companion to or an extension of Pastor Knighton's series that he recently taught and completed on defeating the devil's deception. God's truth always wins. Now, if you missed any of those messages, please go back and watch them on the Spirit of God Christian Church YouTube page. Now, although I said it's an extension, that's actually not fully uh, in a literal sense. What I was want to do though is God actually gave me this message even before pastor began teaching that series. For me that was confirmation that this message is something that God really wants this local body of believers, the Spirit of God Church in Alpharetta, Georgia to pay attention to. Did you know that in Psalms 57 verses 7 through 11 it is repeated nearly verbatim in Psalms 108 verses 1 through 5? Or did you know that the phrase, His love endures forever, is repeated 26 times in each verse of Psalm 136? Well, what's the purpose behind God often repeating things in His Word? He does it to show its importance to Him so that hopefully it will stick with us. It's kind of like when you were a child and your parents would repeat important messages to you over and over again. Things like look both ways before you cross the street or don't talk to strangers or that stove is hot, don't touch it or you could get burned. The topic of the devil's deception is so important. While pastor has already done an excellent exposition God said one more reminder won't hurt. The apostle Peter knew repeating things was important to help us remember them. In 2 Peter, the first chapter, verses 12 through 15, in the New Living Translation, he wrote, Therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. And it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I'm gone. Thus, many of my points today may be reviewed for many of you. For some, I hope to illuminate this subject even more and introduce a few new perspectives. But according to my foundational scripture, which can be found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, and specifically the A clause in the King James Version, it reads, Little children, let no man deceive you. While Eugene Peterson, the author of the Message Translation, says it this way, So my dear children, don't let anyone divert you from the truth. The title of my sermon this morning is Don't Believe the Lies. I'm going to repeat that again. Don't believe the lies. In fact, I'm going to repeat it numerous times while presenting this sermon. Why? Because it's so important, I want it to seep deep down into your subconscious. Uh, the way that a catchy song does. You know, after you hear it one time, you just can't get it out of your head. Yes, I want you repeating this phrase over and over to yourself all week long. Don't believe the lies. Now you may be asking, why is this subject matter so important? It's because lies are the number one tool that Satan uses in his attempt to separate us from God. It was the same tool, a lie, that got Adam and Eve to sin in the garden and eat the forbidden fruit. 
It was how he tried to convince Jesus when he was tempted out in the wilderness to, in the words of Star Wars, come over to the dark side. But Jesus knew how to combat those lies, as we'll see today. He also tried to use lies to convince Job to sin. But Job, while questioning God, never crossed the line of acting on or believing those lies. So what lies maybe have you been believing in your life? Maybe Satan has whispered to you, you're not smart enough to get that promotion, or you'll never get out of debt. Perhaps he said, you deserve this, and you can fill in the blank with whatever the this would be. Everybody else is doing it. You're not hurting anyone. God really doesn't love you. He doesn't have your best interests in mind. Truth is relative. What's true for you isn't true for everyone else. And if God was really a just God, would he have really let, and you can again fill in the blank, happen? Satan will bombard us with so many lies, and if we believe them, we get caught up and separated from God. It takes our power away, the power that the Holy Spirit gives us. We must not believe those lies. No, don't believe the lies. So how can we effectively stop believing the lies of our enemy? Well, that's what we're gonna go over this morning. While it's not feasible to even skim the surface of this topic, I still will give you concepts, notions, and skills for you to think about all week. So let's look at the methodology behind Lucifer's schemes that gives us a good indication of how he's going to try to convince us to believe his lies. And if we analyze them carefully, those tricks and ploys, then we are less likely to fall victim to the deception. You see, Proverbs 4 and 7 lets us know in the King James Version, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. So today we will examine what I believe to be the top four categories of lies. Of course, there are many others, but they're really just a variation of these four core type of lies. And our goal then is to gain an understanding so that we can protect ourselves from falling victim to these lies. Let's dive in. Number one, have truths. Have truths are just where someone tells you most of the truth, but they change it slightly or add an extra element to it, which is intended to kind of look like the truth. A good example is the word play that serp the serpent had with Eve in the garden. Let's take a look at Genesis, the third chapter, verses one through three out of the King James Version. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God, have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Satan here was using that half-truth. He began in verse 2 by telling the woman, I mean in verse 1, telling the woman, Did God really say you can't eat of these trees? That in and of itself was not the full truth. And in fact, Eve knew the truth. She quoted it back to the serpent in verse 2. She clearly said, we can eat of all the trees except for the one that's in the middle. Just one tree. And when we do eat it, in fact, she added a little bit to it. She said, even if we touch it, and that wasn't in the original uh, instructions that God gave, but we can understand that you will die. So Eve knew the truth, yet Satan used 
part of the truth or this half truth to get her off her guard and to start believing the lie. We'll dive into a few other of those uh, lies and how he had some of the other elements that we're going to study today included in that lie back in Genesis. Now, another version of the half-truth is when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and the second temptation that Satan presented to Christ, which can be found in Matthew, the fourth chapter, taking a look at verses 6 and 7, and we'll read that out of the King James Version. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, Satan in this case, realize after he tempted God with uh, trying to challenge Jesus to turn the rocks that were in front of him into bread because he was hungry. He was on a fast in the wilderness for 40 days. So he attempted to challenge Jesus to, to, to prove that he really was God and turn the stones into bread. But Jesus quoted scripture back to him that told Satan, Man is not to live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God. Satan, being very conniving, realized and wanted to use that similar method, quoting scripture, and he actually quoted it correctly. So we had the full truth here. Satan was able to use the full truth. However, he added this extra element which said, if you really are, then prove it. Test God and let's see if he really will save you. Jesus correctly knew scripture as well and knew that there was even greater scripture that topped the one that Satan quoted. And that was that we should not test or tempt God. This is such an important, important lie that Satan uses because it is very popular, unfortunately, with many to this day. You will have ministers who will quote scripture correctly. However, they don't give you the full picture. It is so important for you to understand and know the entire Bible. And we'll get to that point a little bit later. What is number two? The next category of lies that Satan tries to use, it's doubt. Yes, doubt is really an outward expression of a lack of faith. Doubt kind of works like this. God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit will tell you the truth about something or maybe an ability about that you can actually do. For example, you are more than a conqueror or you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can pass that test if you just put in the effort to study and know that God is with you. I want to look at an example in the Bible where we saw doubt creep in because of one of the lies Satan placed there. And it was when Peter was walking on the water. If we take a look at that story in Matthew, the 14th chapter, verses 28 through 31 out of the NIV, it will read like this. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to the water, to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and, and came toward Jesus. Now let's just break this down for a second, because this is very often what we do. Jesus basically allowed Peter to ask what we are to do. We're to go boldly and ask in Jesus' name for many things. In this case, Peter boldly asked Christ, Lord, let me come to you. Let me experience this thing that I see you doing, walking on the water. And what was Christ's answer? Yes, Peter, come to me. You have the ability. I will be with you. 
So that was the truth. However, when we look at verse 30, it says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? There it is. Doubt has crept in. It's that second category of lies that Satan will use. In other words, Peter, why did you stop listening to the truth that I told you that you can do this? When you focused on me, you actually were doing what was once impossible. You truly were walking on water. Yet, that truth that you can do it, why then did you stop listening to me and start listening to the evil one who caused you to doubt? Now, there's nothing wrong with pausing to assess a situation. And in most cases, that's actually wisdom. However, once God has already spoken to you and he clearly has given you a message with clear instructions, then to pause sometimes is the toehold that Satan is looking for to create doubt in your mind. And that was the purpose of why he got Eve to believe the lie even more as found in Genesis, the third chapter and verse four. That's when the serpent said, he shall not truly die or surely die. That was the lie that got Eve thinking. Hmm. Now, Eve knew the truth, but then this lie was planted inside and that doubt began to creep in. Well, we must combat that. And I'll show you some things at the end of this of how we're going to do that. Category number three, immediate gratification. It's a lie that Satan uses as a tool to offer you some reward, some immediate reward for disobeying God. It's often something that you really want or desire. Let's just take a look in the um, testing of Jesus in the wilderness while he was fasting for 40 days. Matthew, the fourth chapter, taking a look at verses eight through 10 in the King James, it reads, again, the devil taking him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Satan wanted to offer Jesus something that he actually already controlled. That was the world. Although we do know that Satan is called the prince of this world. That's because he was kicked out of heaven and he now roams this earth trying to separate us from God. So he feels like he's in charge, even though that's a fallacy, but he presented the offer to Jesus that I can give you rule over all of these things, whatever it is, I can give you that instant gratification if you would just simply bow down and worship me. But that was a flat out lie and Jesus countered that lie with the truth that we are only to worship God and him alone. Another example that you might want to think about was Moses who could have easily have kept quiet about his Jewish heritage and lived in the palace in Egypt under Pharaoh and lived the good life. Yet the Bible tells us that he forsook the sin for a season, those pleasures for the shame to be with his people. He denied that instant gratification that Satan tried to tempt him with. We might also consider the story of Joseph, how he didn't believe the lie that he could enjoy instant gratification by being with Potiphar's wife. Despite her repeated attempts to try and get her to sleep with him, he refused to 
her advances. In other words, a fear of missing out on something. It's called FOMO, fear of missing out on something that you could have pleasure in today. That's just another element that Satan uses. And if you take another look at what the serpent told Eve in Genesis, the third chapter, verse five, we can see the element of the fear of missing out or this element of instant gratification. Satan presented, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, Eve, eat this and you will be just like God. Don't, and you're missing out. This can happen right now. God doesn't want you to be like him, but we all know that that was purely a lie. Unfortunately, it was too strong of a lie for Eve, and she did partake in that forbidden fruit and gave some to her husband, Adam, who also partake. Uh, our final category, number four, is fear. This is when your life on earth and its preservation becomes more important and more valuable and you want to protect it at all costs than your soul and where you will spend eternity. Let's just take a look at how Peter fell into that lie when after Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was so afraid for his life. He knew what was coming for Jesus that he would be put to death and he didn't want that same fate. So he lied. He cursed even and said, I've never been affiliated with him. He did it not once, twice, but three times, just as it had been foretold. He was afraid. Peter also allowed that fear to grip him when he was walking on water. Let's go back and take a look again at chapter uh, 14 of Matthew and take a look at verse 30 where it said, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. In other words, his life was more important at that time than trusting the truth that God told him he could do this. He became afraid. He allowed fear to overtake him. Now, what was it that he was afraid of? It was drowning. Now, what's so interesting to me is Peter was actually an expert fisherman. That means he was constantly on the water, so he was probably a good swimmer. Yet in this moment, he allowed fear to grip him so much that even he, an experienced fisherman and a good swimmer, was gripped and was afraid of drowning and cried out to the Lord. The beautiful thing is, the scripture tells us that Jesus reached out his hand and saved him. That's all any of us have to do. If we really feel like we're drowning in, in whatever life's troubles may be, all we need to do is cry out just like Peter, Lord, save me. And you know what? He'll reach out his hand. He'll catch us. He'll hold us. He'll love us. That's what each of us must do. We must not allow fear to grip us, however. Now, one final example was when the disciples were in the boat and Jesus was sleeping and the storm came about. I want us just to take a quick look at Matthew, the eighth chapter, and look at verses 25 and 26. And we'll read it out of the New Living Translation where it says, the disciples went and woke him up shouting, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. That sounds very familiar. It was the same fear that had gripped Peter when they were in the boat and Peter was walking on water. Here's another situation, but Jesus is in the boat with them this time. He's just asleep and they go and wake him up. It continues and Jesus talks to them and responds, why are you afraid? That's a question for each of us today. Whenever we're in a situation where fear has gripped us, Jesus is asking, why are you afraid? He goes on to say, you have so little faith. 
Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The lesson that Jesus was trying to teach them was that he had already instilled in them the power to do that same thing that he just did. Yet their, their faith had not matured to the point where they were able to exercise that faith. He had already told them, if you just have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell that mountain to be removed and cast into the sea, and it'll listen to you. That is a small modicum of faith. Yet fear comes in and creates that countermeasure to our faith. We must always follow the truth. So what must we do then to counteract Satan's lies? How can we be successful in our quest to don't believe the lies? Well, there are two things I would present you with. Number one, stand firm in your commitment. Eve knew the truth. She was able to tell the truth exactly what God said, that if we eat of this fruit in the midst of the garden, we will surely die. Joseph also knew the truth, that he could not sleep with his master's wife. Yet Joseph did stand firm, unlike someone else, David, who beholding Bathsheba could not resist and just had to have her. He did not stand firm. I want to just take a look at verse 10 in Genesis 39, because I think it's telling. It says, although she spoke to Joseph day after day, we're talking about Potiphar's wife. She approached him day after day. She tried to beat him down. The Bible says he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. You see, Joseph stood firm to his commitment. David again did not. Now, David understood what standing firm meant because it was evidence when he didn't kill Saul when he had the opportunity in the cave. He knew that it was a sin if he were to put his hands on God's anointed. So he allowed God to handle that portion, even though God had already told him he was also anointed to be the next king. David knew and showed restraint. He stood firm in his commitment. It is always possible for us to stand firm. It is not easy that's where we as Christians and believers today have the Holy Spirit coming to lead us to all truth. And we, re we receive power when he comes into our life. We cannot do this of our own willpower. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We must be resolute and have a plan on how to handle that attack or the temptation when Satan does present it. So we need to have that in place before it actually comes about. And just remember, God always makes a way of escape. The real question is, are we going to take that exit? Now, the second method to make sure we don't believe the lies is know all of the Bible, not just some of it. Oftentimes, there are many who want to only read the good things or the blessings in the Bible. But you also have to read what God tells you. If you are not obedient, these curses will come upon you. I want you to realize so Satan can quote scripture. He can even give you to you exactly the way it was written in the Bible. Jesus knew, however, the principle that there often is a greater scripture. So when the Pharisees questioned Jesus about his disciples eating the seeds and the wheat in the field on the Sabbath, Jesus said, there's something greater that you're missing. Let's take one look at that chapter and it's found in Matthew chapter 12, verses one through eight. And I'll read it out of the NIV version. Now at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, 
Your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to eat, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on the Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath? and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. What Jesus was trying to teach the Pharisees is yes, Moses' law tells us it's unlawful to work on the Sabbath, that we need to rest. However, there is an even greater principle at play here, and it is also in Scripture. And he shows them by giving them practical, real examples. He also, in other places, tells them who, if your animal were to fall into a hole on the Sabbath, wouldn't lift it out and save that animal. Why then would not I do works, good works, and heal people on the Sabbath. There may be truth in the things that these ministers quote, but there's also a greater principle. If you know the entire story, you must take it in complete and total uh, consideration. You cannot just look at one verse without considering it in its totality. That is truly a lie from Satan. And if you don't know the word of God for yourself, you could come become a victim of that lie. Well, I know we went over a lot this morning, but I really want you just to take some time this week. Go back, study these passages that I've presented. I want you to really dive into these lies and these four categories of how Satan will try to get you to listen to them and de I want you instead to declare that you're not going to fall for those lies anymore. I want you to only listen to God's truth, which is contained in his word, the Holy Bible. It's something that I need you to commit to learning for yourself. Be able to quote scriptures back to people. Have some in your arsenal for remember, you got to read all of it, not just the good parts, but the entire Bible and then use it, use that word as a spiritual weapon against Satan. Remember, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is something that will counter all the lies. So if you can only remember one thing this week, I wanna leave you with this. Don't believe the lies. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your son Jesus coming into the world to save us because he loved us. He didn't come to condemn us or to find fault with the way we behave, but he wanted to change our behavior to show us that there is a better way if we just follow his advice. And when he left this earth, he didn't leave us alone. He sent the Holy Spirit, the helper, to lead us into all truth, to counter the lies that Satan wants to tell us. Oh Lord, please help us to listen to that Holy Spirit as he guides and leads us into all truth so that we will truly be free and not a captive of the lies of fear, of doubt, of missing out, of, of, of believing half truths. Oh dear Heavenly Father, come in and protect us Shield us, dear Heavenly Father, with your word. Let us quote it back to, to Satan and let us stand firm in our commitments. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this word today and I pray that it blesses someone out there. Someone will go and be stronger today. They'll be able to counteract those lies that the devil has been telling them for so long. They will come out of the darkness and into the mighty light that is the truth. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. And we ask that you be blessed this day. And all the people who can agree with that say, 
Amen. At this time, some of you listening may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You may not have him as your Lord and Savior, the one that you want to be like and follow. I can only tell you from my personal experience, there is nothing like it in the world. We're not perfect. Christians are not perfect. But we try to live out and follow Jesus' teaching. If you're out there today listening to my voice and you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, if you want him to lead and guide you, if you're tired of following those lies and believing those lies that Satan has told you about you and are keeping you bound, please just join me today by saying a simple prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, come into my life. I believe that you are the Son of God. I want you to guide me into all truth. I will follow you, Lord. I will do your te- follow your teachings. I will do your will. And dear Heavenly Father, I believe that you are the one and true way for me to see eternal life and to get to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you were saved now. Find a good church. If you're in the Alpharetta or the northern suburbs of Atlanta, we welcome you to come and join us. We meet every first and second Sunday at the Double Tree Hotel on Holcomb Bridge Road. You can Google it by going to the Spirit of God Christian Church website. Uh, and we would just love to have you as a member here. So if you're looking for a church home and you're in the local area, please stop by, say hello. Our pastor, Pastor Knighton, would love to welcome you into our family. I and the other ministers and believers of our body are always welcome you because we are a church full of love. Thank you so much. I hope you have a blessed week. And remember, don't believe the lies. Wow, what a great service and message from the Lord. We thank you for tuning in and pray that you are blessed by today's service. Remember to invite others to join each week so they can be blessed too. Please continue to support the ministry and download the Spirit of God Christian Church app, if you haven't already, so that you can stay informed on all things Spirit of God. As always, our online giving options are available on the church's app, website, and cash app. Remember, we're in a year of increase by way of decrease. Let's decrease more of self so that Christ may increase in us. Have a blessed week and we'll see you soon.